You're listening to the CD Baby DIY Musician Podcast. Hey there, and welcome to episode 33 of the CD Baby DIY Musician Podcast. This is our roundtable edition, so of course joining me, my name's Kevin, by the way, is Chris and hello. Robert. Say Present. hello. <laughs> we got a great episode for you. We're going to start out with some news headlines, headlines that have grabbed our attention since we last met. We discuss songwriting as we reflect on the previous interview episode. And then Chris is going to lay out his thoughts on radio promotion. And then, of course, we'll wrap it all up with your feedback, your phone calls to our listener line. Well, let's get into some news since we last were together. Um, <laughs> <laughs> thank you, guys. <laughs> well, making big headlines this week is Metallica with the release of their latest album. So far, uh, they've sold 500,000 copies of Death Magnetic since Friday. And uh, the group accomplished a near gold certification despite the pre-release leak that seems to have had no effect at all. The album first found its way on BitTorrent about two weeks ago. And uh, you might remember a few years back, the group made big headlines for its anti-Napster crusade in which they sued their own fans to slow the file sharing of their music online. Yeah, don't do that. Taco Bell is now offering free late night food for traveling bands. It's their Feed the Beat promotion a contest that awards winning bands with free post-dinner meals. A total of 100 touring groups will receive a free supply of fourth meals for one month, a prize valued at $500. You can mm. find more info at feedthebeat.com. But unfortunately, by the time you hear this podcast, the submissions will be closed, but they're going to continue to promote those bands on their website, feedthebeat.com. And the neat thing, they're actually going to weigh them, too, so that by the end of the tour, you'll actually see the the effect that the fourth meals have had on their <laughs> Then after their that, figure. they'll have uh, Biggest Loser Band Edition. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the band that can lose the most weight. In other fast food news, McDonald's works a deal to provide free Wi-Fi usage to Zune owners so they can access the Zune marketplace and purchase music through their Zune player. All four Zune players will be very... Uh, <laughs> damn it. <laughs> Insert funny joke here about <laughs> there being no Zune users. <laughs> All four Zune owners will be very stoked to hear that. And uh, which leads into the last item on our news this week, or this edition, is the fact that Microsoft and Apple both released new revamped versions of their media players, and uh, the new Zune offers a feature that allows users to tag songs on FM radio, among other things, and Apple introduced a completely new line of iPods that included a revamp iPod Touch and iPod Nano. So those are the headlines that uh, I found interesting this week, and uh, what do you guys think? Any Anything... Uh, Newsworthy. Do you, do you really need to be consuming music while you're consuming fast food? Well, and the thing that that struck me as funny about that is that most McDonald's has free Wi-Fi anyway. <laughs> so it's kind of like they're spinning something that's really not a news item. It's just that obviously because a Zoom player does not access the Internet, that uh, it's working to, you know, allow the Zoom store. But you know. It's a move to compete with the the Starbucks um, iPod relationship, which I don't think is all that spectacular, really. Anyway, yeah. I mean, no. don't people just want to get a coffee and leave? Yeah, <laughs> 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 call me old fashioned. But. Um, Starbucks, the thing I wish they had was just free Wi-Fi. You can get it if you do this whole thing of loading up a Starbucks card. It's too much trouble. I'm, oh my gosh. I'm not, uh, you know, they want to get your money somehow to pay for it. Yeah. It's not just going to be free. But uh, the Metallica thing I found interesting. First of all, I saw that they sold 500,000 copies, and apparently they did a Friday release. So That's unusual. Very unusual, and that was just a shortened week. Within a shortened week, they had sold almost gold. So I'm kind of curious, where are these 500,000 people coming from? <laughs> Metallica is still that big. I guess there's some diehard fans still out there. And who knows? I don't know. Maybe new fans. My, my theory is the whole uh, Guitar Hero is 
reinvigorating uh, a lot of the catalog mm-hmm. of these people since rock and roll has been dead in the the mainstream for a while as far as radio play and um and kind of like the more top 40 type leaning stations and things like that that i figure that it's probably all these people that are finding out about them or just reminding themselves you know yeah. by playing guitar hero and that's my theory yeah. well you know i mean metallica is is sort of attached to a certain way a certain worldview almost in the same way that like um the grateful dead was sort of like associated with hip, hippies metallica is kind of associated with metal heads so like in a way like if you dive into that culture like you automatically almost have to buy the new metallica album just by default mm-hmm. <laughs> Whether they, or it's steal or it just and, you know and they do have some albums that i would say are classic albums that if you're a serious music collector of any kind that you should own the other thing that was interesting obviously is that this is probably one of the highest selling albums in a first week in a long time besides uh uh who was it little wayne yeah the whatever the two that were like feuding over their first week sales oh. but uh i don't know i don't remember but <laughs> but it's been it's really big numbers uh that haven't been the norm as of late and uh, it's kind of interesting that a band that made a huge deal about file sharing and then their album gets leaked again and it really has no effect and it kind of Ooh. kind of flies in the face of the argument that the big music industry has been making for a while that file sharing is destroying uh their profits and it reminds me of that uh, a few years back when the Arctic Monkeys came out with their debut CD. They had already, for you know, a certain amount of months, been giving the entire album away online. Everyone in England that liked them had the album already. It got released officially, and then it like it sold. It was like the highest selling debut ever in the wow. UK or something, despite the fact that already everyone already had it. So yeah, yeah. Part of the problem is just that they release garbage <laughs> <laughs> that nobody wants to buy. Oh, man, we're going to have Metallica fans <laughs> No, not, not Metallica. I'm talking about part of the problem. Major labels? Major labels. Oh, major labels. <laughs> <laughs> Freudian slip. <laughs> major labels, not Metallica. Oh, man, that's the worst kind of fan to, get, to, <laughs> no. to be mad at you, too. <laughs> no, I, I went through... Uh, uh, everybody, well, I, I don't picture you two going through a metal stage. Oh, I did. I, I did. loved Metallica. Yeah. I uh, I went through, you know, when I was in high school, Black was all over the place. Their Black album, I don't think it really has a name, but... I had so, a Metallica uh, t-shirt, too, I think. Metallica t-shirts I used to wear. <laughs> I, can't, I can't picture you in a Metallica shirt. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, now here's my rant on uh, my little soapbox about uh, the iPod versus the Zune. I went online, you know, I've, I'm a big uh, iPod geek. I have an iPhone. And um, I used to have PCs and all that and switched to Apple and all. But I've tried to give the Zoom the benefit of the doubt. You yeah. know, I thought, okay, let's give it a fair shake. And with this new release, I went online and watched a whole bunch of little demo videos. Like it was some Zoom network thing where mm-hmm. it's like fan stuff. And I just could not believe how, you know, five years ago the technology still is on yeah. some of the, the thing. There's, you know... It's like you, there's no touch screen, there's no anything, and it's like, I don't know, the thing that interests me about the whole thing with the iPod and, you know, eventually they'll take over the music world until they slip up and someone else does it better. Yeah. But it's just how their innovation is driven, how users use music. And um boggles my mind how a company like Microsoft just can't get it right with the player. Yeah, yeah. It, I mean, it's really, I mean, it's kind of embarrassing. But, with, I mean, I read an article with s- someone from Zune who's just basically like, we're just we're just trotting along. We're not trying to, you know, <laughs> we're not trying to take a huge bite out of the market. We're, you know, f- right. slow and steady is the course. <laughs> slow and something, yeah. yeah. But, uh, but, I mean, the, the features with the new iPods are really cool. The, you know, I... You can shake the I, the new iPod Nanos to go to the next song, or like to go into shuffle mode. So if you don't like what you're listening to, you just physically shake it. What if you're running? I I'm think, sure you can turn it off. I think you can turn it off. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> oh, those and, guys at Apple are so smart. Right? <laughs> <laughs> they have an off button. You can turn that feature off. I have a feeling it's got to be a shake, not a. If you're shaking it that bad when you're running, you've got problems. <laughs> But anyway, the the thing is, it's like the the whole the new Zune, it has that tagging with FM radio, and I thought the iPod is what has killed FM radio, among other things. But 
why am I taking my entire collection of thousands of songs and listening to FM radio to hear the same 20 songs over and over again between 30 minutes of commercials? And I don't understand why. I mean, that just doesn't seem like a big selling and so point the, to me. So the tagging allows you to then buy the song or something. Well, it, well, doesn't, it doesn't. It it, it it somehow tags it and figures out what song it is. And so when you go to the Zoom Marketplace, it it tells okay. you. I don't know. I, so, the the little demo video I saw didn't explain it. But. So you listen to the radio and you listen to something you like, and basically it'll it helps you buy the album if you want to. buy Yeah, it. correct. Which you know is something that actually Apple's doing as well with their with their MP3s, or where they actually show you similar MP3s or albums by the same artist and allow you to buy them, but you don't have to listen to commercials. Yeah. Um, but I will say one thing for the Zune is that they do have this cool um, music search function that's new with their new software, where if you're listening to something, it shows you a cloud of albums that are related to that album, such as like. Um, you know, artists that have influenced the musician that you're actually listening to. And it sort of shows you a cloud of like 10 albums that are somehow related or similar to, and it kind of like a Pandora search feature, That's which, cool. uh, you know, is sort of almost like a little bit of a music history lesson as well as sort of a discovery mechanism. But, uh, you know, besides that feature, I, there wasn't really anything. Did you see a demo of that online? Because I was reading up on it. I couldn't find... The um, reading I did, I didn't find anything about that. I didn't see a video of it, but I read two articles oh. that were talking about it. And both mm. both articles said it was cool. Hmm. So last episode, we heard an interview that my friend Michael Johnston uh, did with Evan McHugh, singer-songwriter in Atlanta, Georgia. And, uh, you know, songwriting is one of those things that's, you know, it's it's not really a list of how-tos that you can do. And uh, people go, oh, okay, now I'm a hit songwriter. But yeah. it's one of those things that's a craft and needs to be developed. So I thought it'd be fun to kind of talk about that a little bit more and maybe the three of us share some of our techniques since we all write music in some capacity. And um, I don't know, maybe the tools that we use, the process that we use, and just uh, get discussion going on that. Chris, you, you write about, uh, you know, five, six songs a day. Is that what it is? <laughs> I actually just finished one in my head while you were talking. <laughs> Chris has a backlog of like 20 albums waiting to be released. <laughs> CD maybe, but, but anyway, so I, I'm, I'm kind of curious. I know how I approach it, but I'd be curious to hear a little bit about how you approach songwriting and then we'll, we'll go around the room. We'll yeah. share ideas. We'll talk. I think that above what instrument I write on or whether I do the lyrics or the music first, you know, all those kinds of different questions that usually get asked, that the driving principle for me is to balance out familiarity and surprise within the, within mm-hmm. the, the song. So I kind of, you know, I'll start with something familiar. Obviously, you have to start with a chord you know or a, a word you know, something uh, very basic. And then I try and build a pattern that's somewhat, easy to get into and then as soon as it starts to get boring for me at least I have to throw something random in um, and then find a way to hopefully make it sound not random so like I guess the way I would describe it is if I have a bunch of uh, dissimilar or unrelated chords in, in a sequence I want to find a melody that feels natural and connects the chords like uh, as if they were uh, you know charms on a on a bracelet or something or yeah. on a necklace so that uh, it's all one thing but does that make any sense? Yeah. <laughs> I just nod. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can't nod on a podcast. Actually, <laughs> actually that's just a lie. I, I mostly just steal from other people. <laughs> well, that's an important an important part is is uh, using other people's stuff. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's... Well, I think, you know, breaking it down even a little more elementary, I always hear people asking, well, do you start with lyrics or do you start with music or do you start with the melody or... So with my experience and every band I've been in, it's always started with, you know, someone coming with a musical idea. And uh, the band, I was in Small Town Poets, we would all kind of spend our time maybe writing like a musical hook or some sort of simple melody. It wasn't really a developed full song. Then we'd bring it to the group and we'd all kind of hash it out. And then the lyrics were always the last thing. But one thing I found that really helpful with songwriting that if you don't have a digital recorder or some sort of small recorder, I would recommend getting one because there's so many times where I'd be playing and go, oh, this is a cool idea. I'll remember it. No problem. 
I'll go even just like ten minutes later. I'll come back and I'll be just it's gone. I have no- yeah, I, I sub- subscribe to the Leo Kotke method where you shouldn't record anything until you've forgotten it and it comes back to you. <laughs> if you can't remember it two weeks later, then it probably wasn't worth remembering. That's that's my <laughs> mode. So I never record anything until I've actually been able to if write I it all. If I went by that method, I'd never leave the house. <laughs> <laughs> That is true. That is true. <laughs> I actually arrange songs in my head too. I don't record anything until I've got like almost the whole thing done in my head and then I'll teach the parts of the band and then record it. Really? So See, I'm kind of ass backwards on that. You're out of this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I, I start with um, usually a few chords and I'll spend, you know, I could spend a whole week playing like three chords until I find like something that feels right to me and then I'll start just singing gibberish over the top of it until I and at that same time like it once I have an idea of the melody and the rhythm of the vocals I'll start sort of plopping in different words and it always it's always changes like as I'm doing it because like I'll have you know a melody that's like da 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 and then um you know and then I'll have a word that doesn't fit into those syllables and that will change the melody just because of that and it sort of becomes a little bit more organic along those lines but and a lot of times I listen for mistakes like if I make a mistake if I sing a different note or I play a different chord and suddenly I'll be like oh well that sounded interesting and like I'll try to incorporate that but for me, it's a pretty slow process, and I'm very meticulous with my lyrics. Like, and I, I mean, the lyrical process, like, I'll usually try to start with an idea, um, you know, an emotion, something I'm going through um, in my life. But then from there, I'll try to find things in the outside world that sort of relate to that. I like to find sort of a root in a larger story so like if i'm feeling bad about a relationship like i might look to something like shakespeare or a movie or po- a poem or something like that that relates to what i'm feeling and then oftentimes i'll bring in elements of that a lot of times i'll actually quote lines from poems or um or books that i've read and sort of incorporate that into my lyrics and and sort of sometimes sort of create more of a mythological element to to the song um, and then try to nail it down with a few concrete details like, you know, where you're standing or what something smells like or, you know, to actually create an, a scene, an environment. But um, not everybody writes sort of elaborately like that. Like I take a long time to write a song. <laughs> Your comment about the mistakes reminded me of sort of what I was getting at with the surprise thing. Sometimes you get into your old habits and your fingers fall where they normally do and the only way to break that is to consciously stop and say, okay, I should do something very unrelated to this right now or just wait to make a mistake and see if it's interesting and then... Mistakes are, I mean, that was how when I had my own band, I would like, I would constantly be listening for the other players in the band to make a mistake and hit something else. And as soon as they did, I'd be like, stop everything. <laughs> what did you just do? Keep on doing <laughs> it. Like, nah. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> With some of the current projects I'm working on, we usually record the, the rehearsals. And a lot of times some of the best stuff I find in there, like when we're working on a song idea, is, you know, something where in that element, I'm not just going to what I normally do where like if I'm working on music at home it gets you know sometimes you're just like this just everything I do is exactly the same where in that element where there's different people you're kind of playing off of I would you know maybe do something completely different you're like ah that makes the song but it needs to be but so you you don't do you have a little pro tool setup that you're using or when you, I when I write a song um I it's just me and a piece of paper and a acoustic guitar hmm. once I get to like maybe a semi-finished point where um, I have like maybe most of the lyrics and and probably like two parts on guitar then I'll um, then I'll track it and what I've used I've used Pro Tools and GarageBand GarageBand's great for that and I also before I used to have a little portable recorder that I use and actually I have a portable recorder now I just usually default to to using GarageBand but See, I love the little portable recorder. And part of the reason why I always forget stuff is that since I'm a guitar player and we're dumb, but <laughs> no, no, but uh, since I use a lot of like long delays on things, if you don't have that delay on there just right, it totally changes the way it sounds. And you may be playing the same thing, but you don't remember what you did to it. And you're, just oh, like, yeah. it sounds, yeah. this isn't good. Do you but, ever write your, your effect settings down for that stuff? 
Occasionally. I, I usually have, you know, just a few. I don't have, like, an enormous amount of effects that I use. I mm. keep it pretty simple. And But um, I don't know. That, to me, it's just, like, a lot of it will just be something that happens in the moment, and it's not something where I was sitting there hashing out for hours and hours and hours. So if I want to use it, where I, you know, I'll be like, oh, that that's a really cool hook for this part of the song or whatever. I'll just want to grab it. And and then the other challenge that I've found with working on music is now that you everyone has, you know, like Pro Tools or whatever and complete, you know, home studios, is the challenge of actually finishing something instead of sitting there tweaking. Endlessly for hours tweaking. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which becomes a big challenge where you just, you know, you're always going, well, let me change that drum beat. Let me go back and fix that and, and never finish the second half of the song. And it's, you know, another thing that I, I, I guess I'm a bit of a traditionalist in the sense that I think I, I love uh, sort of soundscape music and uh, all kinds of stuff like that, that is, is uh, dependent upon effects and a certain mode of presentation. But my favorite music is songs, something that like you can take to its most basic level and have an acoustic guitar at a campfire and sing the melody. And the lyrics are good, the melody's good, the chords are good, apart from how it's arranged. And I think a lot of people now, since they can endlessly tweak and can build from basic, very basic elements, they end up with these sonic structures that aren't quite songs. Yeah. And they're cool to listen to, but uh, I, I notice that I really love stuff that's just... That can how, be broken down. That's how I am, and how, and one thing I would emphasize is that songwriting is a craft that you develop over time. And I think if you're somebody who's in that place where you kind of know, oh, my songs, you know, when you're looking yourself honestly, aren't that great. That doesn't mean you have to stay that way. With somebody, an album I just came across on CD Baby, um, this recent album of hers is amazing. And it's got all these great songs, like, wow. And, and I found out there was previous albums. And I went and listened to the previous albums, and I'm like, not so great. <laughs> <laughs> well, I... Uh... And, and, and so it was cool to see that, it, you know, because we, we were, you know, had that last episode, we were talking about songwriting. It was cool to see right there, you know, that this artist, this was her third album, and the second album I went back and listened to, and there was just dramatic improvement as an artist uh, between the two, both as a singer and a songwriter, so that was cool to see. The uh, the oldest song of mine that I still play is from my f the fourth album I ever made. So I go through three albums of material that I don't want anyone to ever hear, ever remember. You know, from different bands, yeah. but like, I scrapped that much stuff before I felt like, wow, I've written a really good song. Yeah, it it takes time, and you got to keep working at it, and that's why. You know, when we've talked about MySpace and stuff, it's really easy to get your two really good songs done and then spend all your time doing stuff that has nothing to do with being an artist or a musician. And, you know, songwriting is one of those things you got to keep at it. You got to keep developing it. You got to keep being a student of other good songwriters, which, you know, music's readily available. And it's pretty obvious who, you know, some major good songwriters are. And in my songwriter, I don't just mean, you know, the Bob Dylans of the world. You know, there's great pop song there's writers. also leonard cohen there's yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> but sometimes people think songwriter they think singer songwriter acoustic guitar but you know if you're a pop rock band you know you should be a student of people that write really good pop rock songs and lyrics and that seem to connect with people and i'd uh, i'd like before we move on just to share my my little secret weapon for for songwriting with the, our audience it's borrowed from you know the tradition that you tell a bride before she gets married to um wear something something old something new something borrowed and something blue and I always felt that like my song wasn't complete until it had all of those elements in it. Mm. So I, you know, take that how you want. That you could apply <laughs> many blue different being ways. Melancholy blue or what? Being melancholy, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, but that doesn't mean it can't be happy, bittersweet, you know. Or you could substitute that for you know blue for a happier color if you want. <laughs> <laughs> That's but a good. You, the but, next you know. song I write, I'll I'll employ that. <laughs> Well, speaking of songs, let's move into, uh, we were going to talk about radio promotion a bit because, Chris, you had uh, posted a little writing on cdbaby.org that got people fired up a little bit about radio promotion. Why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, some of yeah, your thoughts on radio promotion? I, I called it my diatribe. Um, basically, just from having previously worked in customer service at CD Baby and fielding questions about what's the best way for an indie artist to use their money, and all these people spending thousands and thousands of dollars on radio promotion and getting hardly any results. I wrote this thing 
kind of just not saying not, not to do it, but um, if you are not on a major label or on a label that has a big budget to put a ton of money behind radio promoters, um, it's probably not the best uh, expenditure of your limited resources. Uh, it's basically as simple as that. But I mean, but college radio and and community radio, that's okay, right? I mean, that's oh good. yeah, I yeah. should I should have qualified it as commercial radio. I did say that you should send your music to yeah college local you know local commercial stations that might have a local music hour or something like that. Um, but what what I think comes boils down to is that radio does not have the influence it used to, and. Also, radio is not really accessible, maybe like it once was. I don't know. I mean, for a short time there at the end of the 50s, end, end of the 50s and, <laughs> and uh, the cracking down of payola. And so it just went underground into other forms. But um, before they all got bought out by corporations, you know, DJs used to play local, you know, not necessarily local music, but they have their local flavor. Yeah. So, you know, when I first met my wife coming up to Portland, the Portland area, there was a cool vibe to the radio station. They, they were still playing national bands, but the way they put together and then some local stuff and regional stuff, it had its own flavor. And I'm, being from San Diego, we'd have our own influence, like surf influence and things like that. Yeah. And, and, you know, living out in the South, you'd hear all sorts of different things. But now it's like you go to those places, it's an identical playlist. Yeah. And so it's really kind of closed down to the indie artist. And the, and the main thing was that so many artists, they have very little promotional dollars, and they throw their money away on something that's you know kind of just a big dream it's being It's a pie-in-the-sky yeah, thing, yeah. That, that, you know, that doesn't mean you're never going to get played on radio ever, but there's some serious steps that have to be taken in order to get to that point and you're not going to jump to that point another podcast that i listened to it's actually a radio show this american life they had a story about uh it had to do with money in some sense but they were talking to uh, the biggest seller of uh, lottery tickets in the whole chicago area was this store and of course it's the poorest neighborhood in chicago and this guy was talking about how he spends like three to four thousand dollars a year playing the lottery <laughs> Wow. And it just totally made me think of artists, how they're like, they come to music promotion like they're playing the lottery. Yeah. And they go, someone sells them a line and they throw all their money at it and hope yeah. they're going to win it big when over time all that money really could have put some good promotional effort behind your music to actually help you move forward little steps at a time to get you where you want to be. I think, I mean, it's be wary of any organization that does promotion in bulk. I mean, promotion in bulk, what what is it going to do for you? It's it's like handing off. If, if you go to a radio promotion company, it's like, hey, we'll do this for you and we'll send it to all these radio stations. It's like they're going to send you and everybody else on the planet to those radio stations and those radio stations aren't going to care or they'll play every song once. There are Yeah, there are some, uh, maybe you're referring to one of the same one that I'm thinking <laughs> of, that will take, uh, you know, 30 of their artists, put them, all their CDs in a box and send it all at once. And expect the radio programmer at the station to sift through it like yeah, yeah. no way and, and that's why it seemed like to me just hearing that story about the lottery I'm like that's what artists do they they see that billboard that says you'll be a star just yeah. pay you know three grand and like okay i'll do it whatever i don't know i want to be a star <laughs> and yeah like, like you just said if they get results and the uh, the radio promoter sends you a sheet and says look you were played 300 times last month well it was once in tennessee and once in california yeah. and, once and, and and that's and i think that's the the deeper issue with radio promotion in order for radio to be effective it has to be really focused and all at once and in regions where you're going to be in order for it to be yeah. build this like perfect storm that actually generates a lot of sales. And very repetitive, too. Yes, very repetitive. I mean, you would be shocked at how, if you saw the actual radio reports of how long some of those songs that you hear on the radio, how long they've been in heavy rotation on certain... Um, on many stations. Many stations before people even are really starting to connect with it. Yeah. And that was one thing when our band was getting played on the radio, I'd see those radio reports and, and I'd be like, you know, you go to that town and you expect, you know, everyone in that town must know who we are. And, yeah. And someone would come to your show and say, yeah, I just heard you guys for the first time last night on the radio. I'm like, do you listen to that station all the time? Oh, yeah, all the time. I'm like... <laughs> 
dude, they play us like every hour for the last <laughs> six months. Where have you been? <laughs> and it just takes, it's like, you know, TV commercials. It has to be repetitive over and over again. So paying somebody to get you on a college station for a couple spins is not going to do a thing. And so, it, you know, it's just one of those things where I think there's some so much better w- better ways to spend your money. Um, but playing a gig in front of people, like people remember that, you know, I mean, mm-hmm. like, Putting, putting energy into like playing shows and connecting with people in a sort of much more provocative way is going to be <clears throat> much more profitable in the end. Yeah, yeah, and and build an actual fan base. And so the you know the advice I would have is one always get references, real references. If you're going to spend a chunk of money on anybody, and after that. I would say, you know, really study up on what it is you're even putting your money into yeah. anyways. Because yeah. if you don't understand radio, I mean, it could be fine to find a radio promoter and get good references because there are good ones out there that, you know, have can do some help for indie artists. But if you don't understand how radio works and what you're going to need to do as an artist in order to make that beneficial relationship, then you're still just throwing your money away. Yeah. And, and if, so, you, if you choose to do it yourself, like we encourage people to do on the podcast, um, you know, take the bulk of your money and get a publicist or PR guy uh, or lady and pick maybe 10 or 12 towns that you're going to play in pretty regularly and see if they have colleges and send them the CD yourself and then call, you know, if you're only approaching 12 markets, you can probably make those phone calls yourself, you know, with a couple hours of work. All right, well, let's, uh, let's head into some listener feedback, which is becoming one of my favorite portions of the show. <laughs> Message line 206-426-5683. The number you have dialed 206-426-5683. Yo, yo, what's up, what's up? What's going on, uh, CD Baby? My name is Wakid Wise. I am a 19-year-old hip-hop artist coming out of Brooklyn, NYC. A couple years ago, back when I was like 13, I was at an audition, an audition for Rough Riders. And as an artist, you do not do this. <laughs> now, I'm on stage. As I said, I'm 13, just learning the ropes, blah, 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 whatever. So I'm, getting, I'm on the mic, blah, 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 I'm rapping, I'm rapping, I'm rapping, and I mess up. And what do I do? I go, and you can bleep this out. I go, blah, 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 uh, uh. <laughs> So as a musician, rapper, singer, rocker, whatever, do not do that. Especially don't curse like that. But don't do that because most of the time, if you mess up a little bit, just keep on moving. You know what I'm saying? That's the lesson learned because most of the time, the crowd won't even know that you messed up. So there you go with Kid Wise. That's what I, that's what I got to say. For my two minutes to shine, shout out to CD Baby. Yeah. <laughs> Brooklyn in the house, without a doubt. Find me on myspace.com slash L-A-K-I-D-W-I-S-E and uh, breaking down my second independent album released in September 23rd, 2008. We're taking it to the top, baby! Woo! Peace! Hey, this is Mike with Fresh Green Grass Bluegrass. We're a family bluegrass band from Blue Rapids, Kansas, and we learned a big lesson this year called the follow-up call after we drove about 70 miles to a gig we had set up at a restaurant and uh, found out that they had uh, went and filed bankruptcy and were no longer opened. Uh, luckily, we did find the manager, and he was man enough to pay us a good part of the amount that he said he would, but uh, taught us a good lesson about uh, making a little follow-up call to make sure you really have that gig uh, lined up and ready to go. And also, it even led us to the point where we decided it was time to print out a contract so people knew a little bit more about uh, what we wanted and what we promise versus what we're going to get and uh, i think it was a good lesson for us lucky we didn't lose everything on it thank you very much hi this is lisa the solo artist lisa this might not i don't know if this is going to be funny to anybody but um, it was pretty funny when it happened to us i was to perform at a huge 2000 member church banquet and the request was for contemporary rock And being that I play from rock to rap beats to jazz, world, you name it, I accepted because I said, well, I can set up a rock group. The only problem was that the director told me the wrong site. So the band and I, we get up there and we roadie our own equipment up to the stage. We're ready, the the, uh, smoke machine's up, and 
<clears throat> we take a break. Excuse me. We take a break, and um, then the people come in and roll in, and caterers are out there, and people are excited talking, and then we come out, smoke machines going, and <laughs> we start to rock out. And, um, you know, once I, everything cleared and I could see the crowd, well, they were pretty much an older generation and just kind of staring up at us not knowing what to do with themselves, and I think their mouths were just dropped as in, you know, I was playing a little bit of hard rock, and, you know, they were probably more in the probably 40s music group, so um, that was pretty embarrassing, but uh, at the end, they did clap and probably wondered what the heck. The other group that was supposed to be there was called something like the Baronets or something, so... um, we found out that they were playing more Lawrence Welk classicals. <laughs> so they were sent over to our site. So I'm sure all the Christian rockers uh, appreciated them too. So that's my funny. <laughs> Thanks. So they got... So the, the somehow got, they somehow got switched? Yeah. Were, the rock they, group went to the swing club and the swing yeah. band went to the rock club oh or my church. Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it was nice of the people to be polite and clap. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> going, okay, whatever. <laughs> My favorite detail was the smoke machine. Yeah, like, yeah. Just, at first, when she said that, I'm like, why did she mention the smoke machine? But then I realized how it played in where they walk out, they can't see anything because there's smoke everywhere. And then it clears and there's a bunch of old oh, man. people sitting there. It's like when Spinal Tap plays at the Air Force Base <laughs> and the crowd is not into it. <laughs> Oh, but that was a good one. All those were good calls, and um, yeah. So keep them coming. Uh, if you want to uh, phone in our listener line, the number is two zero six four two six five six eight three. That's two zero six four two six five six eight three, and uh, it'll help you get on the show if you keep your comments, you know, two minutes or less, or. You know, make sure you turn off any background noise like TVs or things like that and and just, you know, have your story prepared and ready to go and we'll try and get it on the show. Also, lastly, uh, Robert wanted me to remind everyone or let everyone know that the Podcast Listener Awards are out now and uh, they're taking nominations. So if you go to cdbabypodcast.com, you can link over and nominate us yeah we'd really appreciate it it's uh podcastawards.com i believe but it also is linked on our website we're in the nomination stages right now so head on over there it only takes a minute just you know select cd baby podcast or whatever category you want um i would recommend maybe putting us people's choice award um or best the, uh, produced best produced <laughs> yes and we really appreciate it we don't ask a whole lot from our listeners and this is we'd love some uh, accolades and uh <laughs> it's all about accolades <laughs> accolades the payback <laughs> do we win a cruise <laughs> do we win a cruise i don't know if we win anything but if but we i'd love to see our name up there so so if you guys can just take a sec to do that um we greatly appreciate it all right well that's going to do it for this edition of the CD Baby DIY Musician Podcast. CD uh, Baby, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ow. <laughs> 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 Got a little excited on that. Yeah. <laughs> You've been listening to the CD Baby DIY Musician Podcast, broadcasting from Portland, Oregon, USA. Shout out to CD Baby, yeah. <laughs>